Today we meet E.J. Nixon, author of the Crooked Brook series and The Span. E.J. offers the indie author audience her experience with being published both traditionally and independently. She shares the pros and cons of each and talks candidly about her feelings on being a writer. Split into two parts, E.J.'s interview brings incredible insight into the self-reflection of being a writer and depth of knowledge of several topics. It was a delight to speak with her today, and I'm sure that you will enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Now let's get to it. Hi, welcome to Indie Authors. Today we have EJ Nixon with us. Uh, Thank you for coming. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, So I'm going to start like I always do with your bio, and then we're going to talk about your book. So uh, EJ is a wife and mother, a foster parent, a reformed corporate lackey with a degree in something unhelpful, and is a 20-year veteran of the horse training industry. She currently works part-time trying to teach adults and children how to not damage themselves on horseback which I've done, uh, in her spare time when she's not ignoring laundry, battling one of the multiple dogs and or children, or acting as an unpaid chauffeur, she gives in to her persistent craving to tell a story she hopes you can lose yourself in. I love all of this. I love every single part of this. Thank you. (laughs) Fun fact. Um, I always try to include a fun fact. I, uh, my husband and I were on our honeymoon. We thought it'd be super romantic to go for a horseback ride. It was, we went to a provincial park, uh, a resort in a provincial park for our honeymoon because Canada. So <laughs> we, we could have gone somewhere, but we didn't. Um, and I had the oldest, slowest, fattest horse who didn't want to do a thing. And she insisted on smashing me into every single tree that we passed on the trail. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. It, when people find out that I work with horses, everybody has a, I got bit, I got stepped on, or something horrible on a trail ride happened <laughs> story to tell me every single person. Um, but I love so horses. you're not alone. No, okay, you're good. not alone. <laughs> good. Yeah, I do. I love horses. And like as a kid, like my, my dad worked somewhere and they had... Um, like a, a barn, a horse barn. And so I was, or a stable. And so I, you know, I went there when I was visiting him daily to brush the horses and, you know, I love them, but this mm-hmm. one was ornery and destructive and did not want to be there. It did not want me on her back and made it very obvious that she was like, Oh, there's a tree, tree branch. Yeah. I'm going to smash you into that. <laughs> to yeah. Get rid of yeah. You. <laughs> The, the trail horses especially get over that job pretty quickly yeah. and they, uh, they're creative in how they show you that they're over it. <laughs> but it was a great, like I, I laugh all the time thinking about it. So it was a great experience. Um, now the book that, that you self-published, right? Cause you've published traditionally, but let's start with the book that you self-published and that's the span. Sure. <sighs> love it. Love it. Ooh, okay. Thank you like right up my alley right away if anyone's wondering I felt like it was a mix between altered carbon dune like it had those sort of vibes to it and a little mad max thrown in so not necessarily because of of the story but that same sort of overall um vibe that it that it has um I totally pictured um Asher, who's the main character, right? Um, brother. He's uh, the brother. Of the the brother of the main Cole is the main character. Asher as um Jason Statham. And then <laughs> Cole is Tom Hardy. I don't know why, but they totally came to mind those two. Whatever works for you. It's funny. I this book right now is in the middle of being recorded for an audiobook. And when I was looking for through people to record it. I I told everybody, I said, I'm finding a British guy to record this. And everybody was like, what? No, they, this, and everybody had opinions on it. But now that I'm hearing, I'm getting samples back from the gentleman who's recording it. And I am so glad that we picked a British guy to do it. Isn't that funny? Because it's, it's strange, but it's working. You know, Cole is very kind of weirdly buttoned up and formal and a British vibe is really working for me. But yeah, I mean, I would I would tolerate a Tom Hardy casting for Cole. Oh my God, I would tolerate a Tom Hardy any day of the week. <laughs> In real life, no matter what. So, yeah. 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 
Um, I also wanted to say it's super cinematic, like the way it's written. I can totally see it as a, a miniseries, a, a something like produced for the screen. I just because of that sort of Mad Maxi, I don't. It's not. It's not necessarily has anything to do. I guess I, parts of it maybe, um, but oh, it's just so good. And I wanted to ask right off the bat because the last name of the family is Pateras. So, I it I, did you look into that for the Greek meaning? I did. Okay. I, yeah. So yeah, the the entire book is a little bit, you know, kind of loosely, it, and it's I have to be careful because when I tell people it's it's a reimagining of the Cain and Abel story, people their first question is, is it religious? And it's no, it's no. it's not religious at all at all. No, <laughs> uh, but no, <laughs> uh, but you know what? I did do a little bit of trying to tie in there with the different name choices and some of the location names just to give some nods um, to kind of the creator vibe I was going with, with that founding family. Yeah. So the, so, and excuse my accent, it's terrible, but um, Pateras is uh, Greek for father, right? That's, and so I was, I picked up on that only because my husband's Greek. Um, So, uh, and then this is the first novel in a long time that's made me actually do research, like want to know, reacquaint myself with the Cain and Abel story, but also um, all of the different iterations of that story. And, and, and I, I didn't realize that in some, some religious uh, texts, it's interpreted a bit differently. And so I went down this rabbit hole and it was really interesting, but let me read out what it's about because I, I kind of jumped the gun because I was so excited <laughs> to talk about it. So uh, this new dystopian fiction, that's what it is. So the span follows Cole P- Pateras, but Dennis, I try to say it with a Greek accent. And, and anyone who's Greek, please, I'm so sorry I'm butchering your language. I have been with my husband for since high school. So for like 30 years. His mother's like, why? Why you don't learn Greek? I don't understand. And it, it, it's because the accent. I'm too embarrassed. And like yeah. no, no, yeah. you it feels like mocking at some point when you do it badly enough. You're like, now I just feel like I'm teasing you. Yeah. So, um, so Cole, the fastidious and calculating firstborn son in the most powerful family left on a burned out planet. When there is a, there's haunting news of someone from his past, Cole begins to question the character he plays and his role in the empire that reigns over the remnants of humanity. After a shocking act of violence, Cole is removed from the protection provided by his status and finds himself with nowhere left to turn. Desperate, Cole is forced to ask an old enemy for help and discovers they want what he needs, retribution. So good. Oh, well, thank you. And and as any of your new authors who may be watching this who are going, uh, the blurb is painfully hard to write. So I'm very pleased to hear that. No, that it, it's it amazing. Challenging. It captures it. I mean, I unfortunately, with this project, I can't, there are very few books that I can sit and read all at once because of the time crunch. Uh, So I've had to leave the book for now and I am coming back to it because I just, it's just so good. (laughs) In my opinion, it's so good. Um, (laughs) Totally, totally. Anyway. Okay. So enough fangirling and and (laughs) No, I love it. I love it. That's that's why we write, right? Yeah, For somebody yeah. to at some point go, I like your words. Yeah, I just, so well done. So like I, I kind of hinted at, you actually have two traditionally published novels. So I, that is Breaking Country, the first book in the Crooked Brook series. And the mm-hmm. second one is Breaking Wicked, which is book number two. Right. And it's really interesting that you went and and in our previous conversation, we talked about why you went from traditional to self. So if you can like repeat what you told me in the past, uh, because I think it's helpful. Sure, sure. So um, the the Crooked Brook series is a contemporary kind of small town romance. And it, the first book in that series, I'd kind of had in my head for a long time, played with writing it here and there. way back when, before I ever gave myself permission to think about actually finishing a novel. And when I started with that one, um, 
it was just for fun tinkering around. And then it got to the point where I got a little bored with the story. I think when you write sometimes, um, you know, you, you write until you feel like you need to have an ending. Um, so I wrote until I finished it. And once it was finished, I still didn't feel like I could walk away from the story and start something else. So I started querying it because I assumed that that was what I needed to do. Um, and I started querying. I knew that I didn't want an agent, uh, especially at that time. I, I didn't think that I would pursue writing very far. Um, so I went to, uh, there's a website called authorspublish.com and their newsletter frequently includes, um, publishing houses that are accepting unagented submissions. So I thought, oh, this is how I clear myself of this story. If I, I'm going to send it out. I wrote up a query letter, kind of trying to teach myself that part of the business queries and synopsis. And I sent it out and sending it out felt really finite to me. So I got to say, okay, now, now what, now what do I want to write now that I don't have these cowboys bouncing around in my head anymore? <laughs> and then kind of, um, shockingly, really, I received a letter back from a small, um, small press publishing house called Burroughs Publishing Group who wanted to put a contract on the book. And all of that was so unfamiliar to me that I, I was shocked. So I essentially went through the process with them, learned a ton of things, wrote a sequel to that, um, and, and went through all of that process. And I got to a point in which I, I contracted the second and the third book in the series with them and didn't want to write that anymore. <laughs> I didn't want to write anymore. I, I had this other story kind of bouncing around in my head. And when I gave myself permission to sit down and start writing the span and putting those characters together, I finally decided uh, once I had a finished pro product that I, I actually wanted to do something differently with this one. Um, and so I was very fortunate to have a publishing contract and very fortunate with what I learned from having that. But part of that process also taught me some of some traditionally published, and I, I can't speak for everybody, but some traditionally published experiences, you know, you really are still quite a bit on your own. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be on my own for marketing and on my own for a bunch of other things, I might as well maintain some of this kind of control, creative control over cover and editing and things like that, that you can um, frequently have to sacrifice if you're going to do traditionally published. And for some reason with the span, I just I felt really confident with where it was. I felt really good about where it was at. Um, and so that one, I decided to self-publish and maintain a lot more of the reins on that one um, than I did with the country books. And so you said um, that you had a contract to write three. Have you written the third one? I have written the third one. Um, and it is, I was under contract. I had a, a due date in which I had to submit the third one. But my country books don't sell very well. <laughs> Part of that is um, I'm not great at marketing, I'm trying to get better at marketing. But um, so the publisher is currently owns the manuscript, has a finished version of the manuscript, but is not willing to move forward with publishing okay. until uh, some later date could to be determined, I suppose. Okay. And if you could just kind of give a little bit of an idea about what the Crooked Brook books are about. Sure. So the Crooked Brook series takes place on a cattle ranch in Montana, and it follows um, one of my favorite characters in the entire series, actually, is a woman named May, and she's in her 70s, and she her she's a widow, and she runs this cattle ranch. And instead of kind of traditionally staffing this ranch with people who are, um, I guess, lifers in that business. She kind of has a way of bringing kind of lost men into her fold. And so she's got this kind of group of men who are living and working on the ranch, not necessarily people who started out in the ranching business. And the first book in the series follows a woman named Alex who comes from Chicago, who is related to May. And she comes to the ranch and um, meets a cowboy because it's required. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and hope, you'd hope that's what would happen. <laughs> I mean, really. 
And and as somebody who's grown up with a crush on a cowboy, basically, since I could walk, you know, it was kind of a necessary thing for me to write. Um, So the first one in the series is an enemies to lovers. You know, her and the love interest are do not click immediately. Um, And then in the second one, we have a little bit of a forbidden love. There's kind of a villain slash the bad guy who is actually a woman in the first book turns out to be the love interest in the second book so we get to have a little bit of a forbidden secret love affair in the second book yeah well if yellowstone has taught me anything it's i too love cowboys (laughs) so (laughs) yes i feel like there have been a lot of women who um because of yellowstone have been awoken to their their love of cowboys i when i first pitched the book i was kind of like you know uh, it was like in 2016, maybe. And I was like, I think everybody's tired of lusting after vampires. I think we're ready to start lusting after some cowboys again. Yeah, so right? So my pitch that we're just going to remind everybody that cowboys are hot, um, you know, for anybody who forgot. So, yeah, there's a couple of, there's a, there's a handful of real hot cowboys in that series, which was fun and really fun to write. Yeah, and I, I uh, also absolutely love like the old style western movies and things mm-hmm. like that and I had forgotten about uh, my love for that and then I started watching a series I it's filmed in Canada I have the worst memory known to man so I'll insert whatever wherever but it's um a, a cowboy-esque series and life on a on a ranch I guess in Alberta and uh just the whole like romantic notion of of ranch life and the big wild open spaces and working with animals. Like it's just such a beautiful setting to be in. And it's so, it's so honest in a way. Well, and I think one of the nice things about cowboys is that especially, you know, the ones that I've met in real life and things like that, for the most part, those characters really fulfill so many of the requirements for romantic characters, especially for some of these tropes, because they care about the animals deeply, most of them, the good ones, right? You really care about the animals. So you automatically get that kind of, uh, I have a gruff job, I work outside, I have calluses on my hands, but at the end of the day, I really care if the baby cow survives. I really care about my horse. Um, So that kind of like hard exterior, soft interior that everybody loves to see in a romance novel, yeah. Um, the cowboy kind of already comes preset at that setting. So it's, it's fun to work around. Yeah. And I think that like the cowboy, uh, a rancher, uh, a farmer, like who raises cattle or sheep or whatever. I think that's what a lot of people forget is that their entire life are these animals. I mean, we won't talk about the unscrupulous factory farming and all of that right. stuff, but like the true, the true, and I, I, I know uh, uh, vegans are going to scream at me, but, um, but ultimately if you are, uh, an, and again, there's, there's a big debate in the vegan community. Can you be an ethical land, right. uh, animal um, keeper and, and commoditizing animals? And, and it's a very touchy subject and I know, but I mean, th- it, true cowboys, true farmers will treat those animals with respect. And I, if I'm going to get such a backlash on that. But. We'll have comments on it, but I, I mean, I agree though. You know, I think yeah. that um, in any, really any occupation, but, you know, especially in farming, um, you know, the ranchers and the farmers who understand that the animals are the ones who pay the bills, you know, ultimately. And um, I've been fortunate enough to work with so many people who put their animals first, you know, um, even in the horse horse business that I'm in now. I mean, there are people whose horses get chiropractic work and acupuncture and specialty supplements and all of these things, uh, you know, and meanwhile, they're like, mm, I'm just going to have Kraft macaroni and cheese for dinner tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are a lot of people who have a respect for the animal and even though it has a job to do and, and actually it's kind of, there's a couple of scenes in those books that addresses what people think about the animals. And, um, and I tried to stay true to, you know, there's a, a job to be done, uh, but that respect and care for the animals really does come first because, uh, it wouldn't be a very sexy novel otherwise. I right. Think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so going from 
super hot cowboy to Cole. Yeah. Night and day. So we've got Cole who for all intents and purposes, he, he sounds like, like you could put him in a corporate environment, but he's also like an enforcer in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so such a stark, like, or, or a dramatic change from sure. you know, these, you know, uh, down to earth, getting dirty. I mean, Cole gets dirty too. Yes. <laughs> we, we won't really talk about it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but really like, he's a really control, he's a very strong character and he's really controlled and he's really, um, calculating and, and so different from his brother, what we know about his brother. And, and, you know, that whole, there's so many things that you, there's so many different ways you can come at this novel, like, um, about nature versus nurture and the similarity between he and his grandfather, and then not his dad and all of these really complicated relationships that, that, uh, it, um, impact him and, and this history, which we won't go into, cause I don't want to spoil anything for <laughs> anyone, but how did you switch gears? Because he is like, if you had a spectrum of the two different types of men that you've been writing about, yes. one's here and one's here, like you couldn't get farther apart. So, yeah, you know, what's really interesting is, um, I probably follow a, less than traditional writing path when I write. And so generally, um, when people talk about being a pantser or a plotter, I'm somewhere in the middle. So one of the things that happens, I have this idea, I know I want to go, I, I have my little, actually, I have my little notebooks that I carry with me and I just write down little random tidbits that come to me. So when this, when the story started forming in my head and, um, you know, one of the first things when you sit down and are actually decide, okay, I'm going to make this idea kicking around into an actual novel is, you know, whose story is this? How am I going to tell it? Um, and so the span is written in first person, present tense, um, in Cole's head. And it was really challenging. <clears throat> the cowboy books had been third person, um, kind of, you know, closed, omniscient, um, and past tense. So when I was thinking about this band, I was seeing all of these kind of present day, like interactions. And I write a ton of dialogue before I write any plot. Oh, interesting. So I was writing and kind of, I, I spend, you know, because I'm a mom and, and I do work, I spend a decent amount of time in my car. Um, and so when I'm in the car, I have these, I mean, like a crazy person, I have these fake <laughs> conversations going on. Uh, in my head. And every time I was kind of bouncing around with who was going to tell the story of this fan, kept coming back to how strong Cole's voice was in these dialogue back and forth conversations I was having in the car by myself. Um, and I decided that he should get to own it. And once I knew that he was going to own this story and he was going to narrate it and everything was going to be from his perspective and his perspective only. Um, it kind of just got this buttoned up, putting on the facade of composure, super, you know, um, almost like a James Bondy character, but it was almost as if somebody had sat down this, this little boy and from the very beginning been like, you will be this human and taught him how to wear that mask. And once that really strong visual came to me, he was very straightforward to write. It was very clear to me what he would do, how he would behave, what, how he would interpret situations. Um, but it was definitely, um, and I don't want to give any spoilers away either, but, you know, in, in the romantic novels, there's a requirement that there's a happily ever after. Right. Um, and for a long time, when I was writing Cole's story, I was kind of like, I don't know if this guy gets to have a happily ever after. Um, I don't know if it's in the cards for him. Um, and it was so freeing to kind of get away from that kind of, uh, structure formula restraint um that I just it was very straightforward to write after I knew his voice that's amazing yeah he's so such a strong character and you you, you like you you feel like you can right away you you get who he is it, from just the way he he interacts with the other characters, the way he presents himself, the internal dialogues that he has. And even through that first um, massive uh, tragedy 
that <laughs> sort of sets everything off or the uh, his uncontrolled moments where he loses sure. himself it, you have to read it it's so good um yes, no, in, and writing cole you know it was really fun to write this very buttoned up character and then to slowly unravel him you know mm -hmm. because he does definitely have like a little bit of a, a mental decline kind of leading to that moment um so it was kind of it was a fun mental exercise so okay what does this look like you know when yeah. you have this guy who is wearing this mask of composure and it's kind of slowly getting chipped it's away slowly, yeah um, you know and I really like that you um used the insomnia as because there's there's he suffers from insomnia right so um as that because I too have suffered from insomnia I don't know if you have but it's debilitating yeah yeah and and you you can't that if you if it's been a um you know, several weeks of it where I've experienced it for several weeks. I mean, like I've been managed to get a few hours of sleep here and there, but you, you do, you start to feel like you're going nuts and reality becomes a, a very sort of tenuous, <laughs> tenuous yeah, thing. It, exactly. No, you know, fortunately I have, I don't have insomnia very often, but I have had two babies. <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah. so baby <laughs> so the, insomnia. You know, the, the concept of sleep deprivation leading to bad choices was a really straightforward connection for me to make. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, oh, everything about it. So good. So, okay. So, um, so you also were talking about like the torturous, uh, sort of, um, it, it, or, or torturing yourself with querying the span like you just you didn't want to do that because I can imagine that the that the process of querying is so fraught with all sorts of emotions right hope uh frustration disappointment this and that like that um why wouldn't you choose not like why would someone want to go through that so right. yeah and and <laughs> There, there are benefits to it, you know, for absolutely, you know, especially um, if, if you're not, if you don't have, the, it does take a certain amount of capital to get a book off the ground to probably the standard and the quality in which you'd like to get it out into the world, um, you know, and so the querying and trying to either acquire an agent or get a publisher to send you a contract, um, you know, it does take a lot of that financial burden away, um, uh, especially compared to self-publishing when you're going to bring in your own, you know, vendors essentially for cover design and for editing and things like that. Um, but it is a soul crushing task. And some of it is even, the rejection isn't even all of it. Um, just sitting down, and, you know, writing um, a query letter and a synopsis of your book can be some of the worst, hardest, right? I mean, you'll just sit down and go, I don't, I can't word. I don't know. I don't know how to, and I still <laughs> word. you know, people will ask me and they'll be like, what's the span about? And I blue screen. I'm like, I don't know. No, here, it, read it. Hey, just, please just start reading it. And if you hate it, throw it away. I don't know what to tell you. But, you know, so writing a query letter about your novel and a synopsis about your novel, um, especially for me, where I'm kind of like, oh, it's terrible. Don't bother. I'm sorry. I wasted your time. Thank you. Goodbye. Um, you know, things like that can be really hard to write down. Um, and so some of the hardest words you'll ever put down will be something that you put down into a query letter. Um, and that doesn't even address then to query really well and correctly. You know, you should be tailoring your query letters to the publisher or the agent that you're looking to. Um, so it involves a ton of research on the publishing house, a ton of research on the agent, what they like, what they don't like, thinking of comparables, because we're all supposed to be writing a new story, but they also want to know which three books are exactly like your book. Yeah. Um, and, and so all of that time consuming process to do it really well, where you are tailoring your letter specifically to the organization you're writing to, um, and then to, you know, if you're lucky, you can get five, 10 out in a day, maybe more if you're kind of doing this full time. Um, and all of that is really hard. And then the rejections start coming, <laughs> which, you know, makes it even worse. Um, but being rejected is, is definitely just part of authoring in general. Um, but it can, I mean, all of that together, all of the time and the energy to write it, to submit it, to query it, to send it, to then wait. 
um, you know, and to learn everybody's rules, you know, they yeah. want it in a certain way. They want this, they don't want that. They want a su simultaneous submissions, no simultaneous submissions. When did you send it? Are you babysitting it? Are you going to send a nudge? Are you not going to send a nudge? Um, you know, all of that is really, really time consuming um, and can be really, really worth it um, or not, you know, and it's just a gamble. You have no idea um, what's it's going to happen. Yeah. And it sounds like the time spent on all of this could be put into your marketing yourself, marketing your book, you know, uh, scheduling, whatever book signings or, uh, or author events and that sort of thing. So yeah, I could see how, how the one would be more attractive than the other. And, and I think what would be torturous for me would be the synopsis. Like this is your pitch and you have just that fragment of time to get someone's attention and if you do it wrong like that's too much pressure oh that's it's a lot and and yeah. it turns out that you know half the time you know you spent you know however long you spent writing the book then editing and reading and looking and trying to you know put the polish on it that's required to be able to send it out for querying um and then and then they go okay well give me 500 words what's it about and you're like oh really because i've read it 700,000 times so boiling it down to with two pages, that's going to go great. Yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah. Oh, that sounds awful. Um, so I, I like that your writing goal, because when we talked before, you said that your original writing goal was for every successive book to be better than what came before. Um, and that you were looking at each at each project as a way to develop, to improve. And I, I like that idea. I mean, I think a lot of people hope that but they just are like well they focus on the story mm -hmm. more than the actual technique behind telling the story so how do you constantly try to improve upon yourself um I for one is that I think part of learning is to be able to go back and look at your previous work and be really honest with yourself about where it fell short um you know I think that if if every time you read something that you've written, you, you're not really asking yourself what's broken here. Uh, there's not really a good way to then try to to fix that in, in future writing. So I think one is that you go back and you look at your old work and you go, okay, if I were doing this all brand new today, what would I have done better? What would I have done differently? Um, so I do that. You know, I try to maintain a critical eye when I look at things that I've previously done. Um, which is not to say that I revisit and go, I'm going to fix this. Cause I actually, I'm once it's done, it's out, it's done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to come back and I'm never going to make breaking country a different book than it is. All I'm going to do is look at it and go, okay, you know what? I didn't quite plot my, um, structure very well in this book. And I probably could have come back and done that differently. I'm never going to rewrite that book, but I'm also not going to make the same mistake when I write it again. Um, and the other thing I do is that I do try with what time I do have to to read and watch things. Um, you know, the master class that Neil Gaiman did was a exactly that. I mean, it was a master class. I think, you know, obviously he's one of the best fiction writers in our time. Um, and so being able to sit down and and his master class um sections were just invaluable. There's just a handful of things that um, learning from that that I've started incorporating in my own outlining and my plotting and my writing. Um, and then lastly, I, I've i been very fortunate to surround myself and um, find myself in a group of other authors who bring different perspectives, um, who are willing to give significant, really valuable beta feedback. Um, because with the first books, you know, I had beta readers. It was my mom, you know, um, and she loved it, you know, spoiler. Uh, and she thought it was great. And and having somebody like that to tell you that they love your work is one thing. But having other people to go, I love your work, but really this, this and this is actually more valuable. So I find that between kind of those three things, trying to learn new things, going back in and being critical of my previous work and surrounding myself with people who are willing to give actually well thought out constructive criticism. Those three things have worked together to help me be a little better at every book. That's amazing. I love Hopefully. that. I love that. Um, now to talk about 
something that we had discovered while we were having our previous conversation. I found the name of it. Um, oh, okay. great. Yep. And uh, to anybody who's a psych major who studies these things, again, I pray that I am pronouncing it correctly. I should have looked it up, but aphantasia. So aphantasia is a phenomenon in which people are unable to visualize imagery in their head. While most people are able to conjure an image of a scene or face in their minds, people with um, aphantasia cannot. And again, another fa fun fact to how we discovered this is you had sort of touched on it. And I had just had recently a conversation with my husband because he also has the same thing. So mm -hmm. I find it remarkable because he's a creative soul too. And so that, because when I'm thinking of something, like we talked about, imagine the red apple, right? And, and that's, in fact, that was the example that when I started researching it, that they use that red apple example. And so, you know, I, I have, I can describe the room and the time of year and this and that, and the way the light falls and all sorts of things. And then when my husband does the same activity, he's like, yeah, no, I know what a red apple is, but yep. I'm not bringing any imagery to mind. So, so, but you can still create. So, yeah. the, and, and so that shows that the, the mind is so flexible in the way it, it can rework itself to accomplish a goal. But so then when you're plotting out, like, do you ever, I guess, this is kind of a silly question. If you have, if you are limited in, in the way you can imagine things, but like for, I'm, is it more of an external process? Like you see someone, you say, oh yeah, I, I think Cole would look like that. Or do you create Cole? Like, I, how does this all work for a writer? Yeah. So, you know, for me, like you said, you know, I'm a picture of the apple, close my eyes, black screen. I got nothing. I get, I, I get nothing. But, I, and what's interesting about that is that not being able to picture it when I close my eyes doesn't at all prevent me from making it up. You know, so if you said, um, make up a monster. I don't have to close my eyes and um, be able to picture something with, you know, multiple eyes and green skin and huge teeth. I can creatively can decide to pick and choose from things that I've seen in real life or things that I've never seen in real life. Um, and not being able to see it when I close my eyes, I think if anything, I just take a little extra time um, in descriptions. So I know exactly what I want something to look like. And I think that maybe for authors, it's actually not quite as detrimental as it would initially seem, because all it means is that I have to sit down and I have to be able to, um, to my own self, describe what this room is. If I want there to be a very specific room, you know, so in the span, Cole has an apartment and I need it to look a certain way. I need it to feel a certain way. Um, and if I close my eyes, I can't see it. But I also know exactly what I need it to tick off in terms of description boxes to bring a reader over with me. Um, because I, and so I think I'm a little lucky because I, there's nothing I'm taking for granted. It's not automatically in my head and I assume other people have it there too. I have to describe it to myself um, just as much as I have to describe it to a reader. So uh, it does not seem to hamper me, but I, I don't really know what it's like on the other side. I don't know what it's like to see the bright red apple and the light shining through in the gingham table. I have no idea what that's like. Oh, you remember uh, my, my gingham <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so I think that if I had originally had that and lost it, that, that would be maybe something that was harder, but for, for never having had it, it doesn't feel like I'm missing out at least. Hopefully not. Hopefully everybody can still read what I've written and oh, it, it. I think that you do have like this superpower because for me, I, I get very bogged down with d the description because I'm like, Ugh, it's right here. Like it's almost to me unnecessary, but it's absolutely necessary. And that's why I think that the imagery that's in the book, like uh, there's a scene where he goes into this underground area and, and you you bring it so uh, to life because you are, you have this incredible uh, attention to detail in the description. And so that's why I'm saying maybe this is your superpower that you can't do that because you're not taking things for granted. And right. yeah. yeah. And that's why Cole is so, you, you totally get him right away. Like you understand what this man is. It, 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 the, at the whole, like, I, I, I'm so blown away by it. Cause it's, I've, I've, 
I think I've gotten a quarter of the way through and yet I feel like I'm, it, I'm so understanding the story and I'm so confident in my my interpretation of the story because you were so clear in all of the descriptions of the characters and, and the scenery and and the different situations they find themselves in. So I would say that it's a benefit. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's working. But yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate you saying that so much. You know, it's it's been interesting to get some feedback from folks about this book because um, it starts a little on the slower side, I, I think. Um, and so, you know, I've gotten the feedback that like uh, the ver kind of muddling through the first few chapters, but like, I'm really glad I stuck it out and things like that. Um, but I do think that uh, even before I published it, I had a little bit of that feedback and I went through and tried to rework it multiple times and was kind of like, no, I just need everybody to stick with me. I need you to know this man. I need you to know his family. I need you to know the world they're living in. So I need you to just please hang on with me and um, and get it moving a little bit. Uh, but I'm glad that the description level works because I think that a lot of times authors, we kind of have a hard time finding that midline, you know, because we don't want to do the information dump where we, you know, describe every single piece of artwork in the room and what does it smell like? What does it sound like? And, and just really inundate and, and info dump and, and bore people with descriptions. Um, but at the same time, you want people to feel anchored in the story. They have to... Um, know enough about where they are and who they're with to care about what happens next. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it's a really hard line to walk. It, it definitely. I mean, if you've ever read any, and I've mentioned this in a previous interview, so dear viewer, dear listener, I apologize if I'm sounding repetitive, but like if you read D.H. Lawrence, right, who was, had, uh, went on and on about how the wind would rustle through <laughs> the field. Right. And quite honestly, it was, it's challenging to, for me, like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I get it. The wind is rustling through the field. I don't need to know what every blade of grass is doing or every right. whisper of sound that it's creating. And I mean, some people love that. I'm not a lover of that. And it's so interesting that you say that people uh, were like, oh, you know, it, it's a little bit slow in the beginning. Cause I didn't find that at all, but maybe oh, because I'm, I, I like that sort of, it, it created this dark atmosphere and I really love that. And, and I thought that there was a lot of action right out the gate. Like, oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So I, I never once yeah, thought that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. It's, it's, it's a tricky balance for sure. Mm -hmm.